Hello, here we are for another episode with another adoptee. We have Allison Olson coming from Oregon. Hi, Allison. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a Patreon. Yes, and you're a Patreon, which we really, really appreciate. All about supporting you guys. Yep. Well, well, dig in, tell us your your story from the beginning, you know, how you want to phrase it. Yeah, and I know you have a little bit Mm -hmm. of another story in inside your story. So sure. Let's let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So I am Allison Olson. I am an adoptee, an adoptive parent and a children's book author. And I've been listening to you guys for quite a while, which I know we already had some discussions (laughs) before we hit record on that. And I follow you guys on Instagram all the time. Uh, But I wanted to share my story today, um, as well as making adult adoptees aware of the current landscape in uh, children's literature that's being read to young adoptees. I think yes, that, I think very, it's important. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it was very interesting to me to see another side of the adoption triad. Yeah. You're seeing so, it from all sides. Yeah. Well, I, I have not yet been a birth mom. Oh, but, that's true. <laughs> you know, but, but I do get to, um, you know, talk with the birth mom of our daughter quite a bit. So, um, but I'll start with my adoption story. So I was born in 1979 and all of my different adoption terms are, I'm an infant domestic closed adoption through an agency, right? So kind of level sets. What what state were you in? Oh, Illinois, you said. Illinois, Illinois is where I was um, adopted and, and born. Our agency was in Iowa. And the way that it worked back then, so think, think about the time frame of 1979. So it's post, uh, baby scoop, Mm -hmm. um, post row, post row. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. And so, so there actually were fewer available uh, babies, babies to adopt. Um, and the way these agencies worked is they worked in like a radius, a very small radius to their location. So if you moved, which my parents did move and just like a few small towns over, they had to find a new agency, sign up and go through everything again. And at that time, the wait uh, was about five to seven years uh, for for a baby. And there was an age out period of 42. So definitely- Your parents um, had infertility issues? Is that, was that the, okay. Yep, yep. The the most common reason, yep. They had infertility issues. And, um, so yeah, the interesting thing was I didn't know about the radius until I was older. So, and then you're like, oh my gosh, my birth family was very close to me. This was just to be clear, like an hour and a half radius from, uh, I won't say locate like detailed locations here, but an hour and a half radius from the agency Mm. to us, which doesn't make that very far. So right. If you shifted, in. if you shifted towns or something, you had to go to a new radius. New circle. radius. Oh. Yeah. You fit, find a whole new agency. Go. But it would be the same situation again. wherever you were, right? If you wherever you, you were shift towns, it's still going to be that uh-huh. that, that radius. radius. Yeah. yeah. In in central, you know, central Illinois at the time, central Illinois, Iowa, all of that at the time. Um. And so, uh, so anyways, what I found out later in life. Uh, was that the reason my family was selected was because they were the furthest away. So it was a very last minute decision, of course, by the parents of my birth mom, right? So so my you know maternal grandparents, my birth maternal grandparents mm-hmm. who were guiding and um, you know the making ones the choice for her. making all the choices around was she around was she adoption. young a teenager she, she was not and I didn't learn that until I was older so I got uh, one sheet of paper with about four paragraphs on it uh, the tiniest paragraph of course was about the birth father you guys are used to used to yeah. that it was like didn't even have like his hobbies or like nationality it was like <laughs> he was generally this height this yeah. or what it was like they knew nothing about him so Uh, but yeah, so I did not know very much, but, um, she was, oh my gosh. And now the actual facts all escape me, but like 30 or 31 when she had, oh, she was older and her, why were her parents dictating her decisions? Well, it all came to light later. Um, and, and I'll, I'll, um, talk a little bit about, you can tell that when you want to, yeah, a little bit later, but, um, 
but what I found out later was I am not the first baby uh-huh. that she placed for adoption. So that's why. So, so she was forced into this the first time, forced into it kind of the, the second time. Huh. And I can only imagine you're picking the furthest family away in this radius because of the shame that was associated, all of those things that were so common back then. Right. I just um, have to say, like, I know it's the middle of your interview, yeah. but isn't it strange how like you could literally go home with this family or this family or this family. I always it think is. about this all the time. And I then, think about it all the time. Uh, yeah. This is the one because of location. It. Yeah. Sarah went home with hers. I went home with mine because of whatever circumstance, but it could have been someone down the block, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it could have been. And you guys talked about, um, you know, I have heard you guys talk about, they could just be at the grocery store. Like there was someone that it was like, they were playing at the same yes. park all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, I'm glad I actually didn't know that <laughs> growing up until I, you know, until I was older. Yeah. Cause were, yeah. were you the first child that your parents adopted? Sarah, that's exactly what I was going to tell you. So my, <laughs> I have an older brother. So I have an older brother also He's adopted, also adopted a year and a half older. And I'll go ahead and a- answer it before you ask. Cause everybody asks it. No, he is not biologically related to me. It's just mm-hmm. like, everybody asks it. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. So, I have an adopted brother too. Who's not biologically there, related. So there I think you that's go. common. Um, yeah. well, it depends, your parents, right. It's kind of difficult, at least for my parents at the time, it was very difficult with that agency to, to be able to adopt a second child. So they had just adopted my brother. So like on their side, I was totally a surprise. I was a baby born phone call. So, you know, on the birth family side, it was like, Oh, let's find the farthest family away in this small radius. Um, you know, and like, basically they decided it at birth. Who's that? So, so it was like, whoever came in at that moment on the list was furthest away would, would be where I would be raised. Yeah. No other criteria was what was told to me (laughs) later. Yeah. Um, And so on my parents' side, I was a baby born call, but back then they didn't tell you over the phone, at least with the agency that they worked with, they made up an excuse. Um, They, they were on vacation. My parents were on vacation and they said, you have to come back. There's a new social worker you have to meet. And I said, "Uh, can you just wait until we're back from vacation? They said, no, it's urgent. So I flew back from vacation. They went to the agency to meet this new social worker uh, who then told them, no, actually, there's a baby that was just born in this hospital down the street. Are you interested? Blah, blah, blah. And they had just put their name back on the list because after adopting a child, at least with this agency, there's like a period of time where you can't go back on the list because, again, so few babies at this time in 1979, so few babies, so many people waiting they were trying to get the childless families, children first. Right. But again, the only criteria was farthest away and they had just put their name on the list. So they probably like kind of bumped ahead of some other families because of that. Um, but so I was a total surprise. And so my mom is sitting there like, uh, I have a one and a half year old in a crib. I don't even have another crib. So she's like, can I just make a phone call before we all go head over to the hospital and calls my grandpa is like, you need to get to our house. You need to put together a crib. We're coming home with a baby. So I came home at five days old. And I, the, what happened in those five days, as we all know, is a total mystery. Yeah. I very likely was not held. I mean, these are things I did not think about as a child, but that I sure of now just in the hospital. They, you know, I don't know if nurses held them when they were being fed or if there was something where they just stuck the bottle in or something. I don't know. Um, but then straight from the hospital, I, uh, went, went to my family. So Sarah, you were going to ask a question earlier. I'm sorry. I just wanted to give well, all the background on it. I didn't keep track. Okay. I was, I yeah, was thinking, I was thinking, then how, how were your parents? Did you have a decent relationship? I mean, you could have been another family. <laughs> I know. <laughs> how, well, how, you, did, how was your yeah. childhood? Well, upbringing? Yeah, that's one part that I wanted to, I just wanted to say, because I know that there's so many experiences that are different, Mm -hmm. right? So many that are different and so many adoptees that I, that I talk with or that I hear on, you know, on you guys' show that, that have had rough experiences. My childhood was pretty good. It was Mm -hmm. pretty good, but I think that's important for folks to know, especially on this show, to understand that foundation, to hear that I still have trauma. There are yeah. still things that come up and I realize, yeah. oh my gosh, that's because of, because relinquishment of trauma. I mean, that just, that's it. <clears throat> that it, it's that that's, I think everybody who was adopted has relinquishment. They trauma. Do. 
they do. And, and, and I'm just... not, they're aware of it. It's, it's there. Mm-hmm. It's there. And it, and it shows up in, in different things, right? Mm-hmm. It shows up in different things and I'll kind of walk through where it's shown up, especially with going through the process of adopting myself and how I've seen it come up. I'm like, Whoa, Whoa. You know, or my husband will point it out. Like, Hey, normal people don't do this. <laughs> like you're, you're doing this for some other reason. But the one thing I want to say with my childhood and again, it, like, was it perfect? No. You know, like, do do my family, like, do we still get in fights? Do we have issues? Like, yeah, yes, we do. Um, But a few years ago, probably like, I don't know, six years ago or so now, um, I bought the book and I'm going to butcher the title, like the 20 things you wish your adoptive parents had known about you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've never read that, but I've seen it. It's a quick read. It's, it's, um, It's a quick read, but I read it and I was actually in a fight with my mom at the time and I read it. And I thought, wow, they did a pretty good job for as little training as they received in 1979. They did a pretty good job. So, so, so I want to set that foundation so that when I talk about these other things, that it's important to hear that, like, I didn't even like, I, I didn't like win the lottery on which family I got assigned to. I just had a good upbringing mm-hmm. where they talked about positive adoption language. I always knew I was adopted. They were very honest about what they knew, what they didn't know. They were very open when it came time for me to search for them, like all of those things. But as, as we said before, like it doesn't, it doesn't prevent other no. trauma. And it also still means that I'm cautious about things for my daughter and things for young adoptees, you Mm -hmm. know, it, it doesn't, it also doesn't prevent all of the crazy and terrible things that random people say to you when they find out you're adopted or when you're an adoptive parent. Yeah. So. And were you close to your brother? Um, I was, so I will say growing up, we had, uh, you know, like when kids are close in age, we, you know, we, we would fight, we would do all the things. Now we are very close. Um, but we also from time to time, you know, chuckle and we're like, ah, at least we don't share DNA with some of these people, you know, which we love. We love yeah. everyone in our family, obviously very, very much, but, um, you know, we, we are different and there are definitely things about us where we are uniquely different and different from each other. And not, well, not to well, know, of his course, story. you don't share DNA. You're going to exactly. be different, right? Not I mean, to know his exactly. story, but has he, um, has he, have you, because you're such the networker in this, has he done any of this himself too? Um, so my reunion story was not the most positive mm-hmm. and he being an older brother and very protective of me, uh, was very like upset about how it went. And so that made him have zero interest in doing it for himself, squashed Mm -hmm. his, and then, and mine wasn't even, wasn't even that bad. I mean, I can get into a little bit here, but, um, but he just, he was, he just wasn't interested. And then, um, I, I'm not going to share his story, but a family member did find him on 23 and me not too long ago. And I just kind of gave him a heads up when he started, you know, talking with them and stuff. And I'm like, you know, I'm so I'm, I'm excited for you to get to meet people that, you know, you finally, you share DNA with, and, you know, I'm here for you on this journey. And I said, but don't get your hopes up, you know? And, uh, and he definitely encountered some, some stuff that also had him emotionally, um, Mm go through some stuff from that as well. Um, but he then was able to kind of put it in frame of reference, you know, like, okay, I have my adoptive family. I have this, uh, birth relative that I've met. We maybe aren't, we don't, maybe don't see eye to eye. We maybe have some differences, but it's good to meet everyone and know people. Mm -hmm. It's not all the Hollywood ending, is it always? (laughs) No, No. And in fact, you know, I'll go ahead and talk about mine before I get into adopting my daughter. Cause that's actually the order, you know, it happened in, um, Mm -hmm. in my early thirties is when I, um, found my birth mom about when I was about the same age as her is when I, when I found her, I started looking in late 20 in my late twenties. Um, and in Illinois, the amount of red tape and granted that was, I don't know, 45 years ago now, or not 45, 15 years ago now. I was like, you I'm don't almost look that old. You look I'm, great. Right? I'm like <laughs> 70 something. No, <laughs> it was about 15 years ago now. So 
laws and rules may have changed. At the time, they had a brand new system that was to search for a birth family. It was this, I can't remember what they called it, but like a directory or something, but you have to put your name on this directory. And separately, your birth family has to put their name on this directory without talking to them. And so if you go and fill out this paperwork and they look and a birth relative is on there, that then you can immediately get contacted. Otherwise, all this paperwork They'll send, they'll try to search and they'll find, they'll find out who they can find. Then they send you an email. We found an uncle, your birth mom and an old dog they used to have. I'm just kidding, but it's ridiculous. This weird list. And then you circle who you want to connect with. And then they send them physical letters, snail mail. And it just was, it was so ridiculous. And, and I, um, I recently read a book and I'll have to, I'll have to go and look at what the title was, but it was a very, it was from another adoptee and it was similar search kind of a thing where you are talking with a social worker who who knows a lot more about your story and will not tell you. Yeah. I went through this too. It's the shadiest thing. And, and what I try to- It is shady. It is is shady. shady. And I try to explain to people because I have a lot of people that don't understand because nowadays, like 90% of adoptions are open Mm -hmm. and like the different, and and I get a lot of adoptive parents that don't, I do a lot of adoptive parent education because a lot of them don't understand because they'll say things like, you know, communication has stopped with the birth family. And so our relationship has moved to closed. I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Closed means legally the courts are sealing the names. We're just talking names, names from the adoptees. Yeah, that's closed. That is closed. And then open is you've got names. And then this whole spectrum of like, you hang out every day and, you know, birth grandparents babysit on the weekends, you know, like, so that that's the spectrum, but it can never go back into closed. And they just really don't even do those anymore unless it's through an, you know, through an attorney and the birth mom is adamant about it. And like, really wants to be hidden. So it's very rare now. So they, it's like people today don't understand that I am 44. I'm a professional. I'm a taxpayer and I cannot get my original birth certificate. Right. You or know, like if you do problem. get it, it's stamped saying this is not a real, this is not for legal purposes or something. Right, that's that what mine, mine, I just oh, got yeah. mine. Mine says that too, sir. Yeah. I just like saw it's that a, there's a big thing. stamp on it. Yeah. Oh it's not real. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh not gosh. real something. I, I, I don't even, yeah. You're right. It's, it's terrible legal purposes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. And so, so I was, yeah, same, same as Sarah's experience with the reunion. I'm talking with a social worker who knows my details, who like knew. So she knew I, my parents were selected because of the distance and she knew other information as well. And just like, wouldn't share it. And that it, it was the craziest thing. And then you're talking with them and in the moment and in all of it, you don't realize how messed up it is until years later, when you look back and you just think she should have just told me all that, you know, it literally is our taxpayer dollars paying someone to keep this information from us. And now as we're older, very likely that birth mom would want to know us or want us to have that information. Like who, who's this protecting? And also we we want it. They want it. We forget need the, the even just the moral, like forget the moral judgment of that. Yeah. Right? It is wrong. Yeah. It's it's yeah. more. It's it's a, it is. it's a it's a ethics thing of like what, but but also just not even being able to have your medical information. Um, it's re- it's yeah. insane. I it's like totally how you said. You know what? You've said something that no one has said yet. Maybe a little bit, Fred, on our show. But you're a taxpayer yeah. paying someone else to keep this from you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's exactly. And, mm-hmm. and so I had asked for, I said, okay, well, can I just get medical history? And they sent them a form and they left it all blank. And they Ugh, said, yes, come on. I know. And, you know, it's like, oh, we don't know of anything. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, and, and so, so I will touch upon this reunion here just for a little bit, uh, because it is a little emotional for me. Um, there, there were some positive, cool things that come out and it's really the only thing I like widely tell other people, but with you guys being adoptees, the listeners being adoptees, I will tell more. So I think, um, for me, and this is like, 
my family doesn't even really know about all of this. Like all, you know, it's just, it's, I keep it very, very private, but again, only for the adoptee community community, because you're the only ones that understand. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it was definitely not Hallmark movie lifetime kind of stuff. Um, so it wasn't this glorious reunion. I did not feel some deep connection. It also wasn't negative. It was like, kind of like meeting a stranger. And, um, I was looking for anything where we were physically similar because, you know, when you grow up in a family where there's nothing physically similar, Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my gosh, is is she, how I got these nails. I've like, naturally, like, this is not a French manicure. It's just my nails. I'm just Mm -hmm. lazy and don't do anything. And this is what pops out of my hands. So didn't have the same nails. She had this cute little button nose. I have like, it was very long. I'm like, uh, and I'm literally as she's talking, just like staring at different parts of her body, trying to find an earlobe that looked like my anything. I am very short. She is tall. I am small. She was bigger. Like it, she has green eyes. She has brown. It was just like, you name it. She was totally different from me. And my purpose of finding her was not to have a relationship was not to have a connection. I just had this weird sense getting to that age where I'm like, I just want to make sure she knows that I'm okay, that I had a good life, that I, that I'm okay. And I want to like give her that comfort and just tell her, thank you. And say like, Hey, I'm doing okay. And so that was my only intent. And I got I'm guessing that. that's not what you really felt though. No, it, it was what I thought, but after meeting someone that didn't look like a relative, it felt like I didn't like that, that didn't actually happen. It was very weird. But so like my bar was low for what I wanted. And then I felt it it was so weird. I actually didn't talk to anyone for two weeks afterwards about it. I, I couldn't even, I was like, how and was she wasn't. emotionally? Was it emotionally? No, she was, know. she was just fine. It was, some things were difficult because she had not moved on. She never married and had kids. Um, and so it, it was like, she was kind of now like wanting a relationship and wanting things that, and again, you know, it's not, she did not search me out. So it kind of just felt like, okay, what's going on, you know? Um, so did you only meet her once? I only met her once. And were you just not, you didn't continue a relationship? I mean, cause sometimes we tried, yeah, we tried, we had a phone, we would it's talk hard about to once connect a week. sometimes it is hard to connect. We, we would talk once a week on the phone. Um, and we did that until, you know, it, it kind of fizzled out with, with busyness and just other things. And then she moved and never gave me the new landline of where, of where she moved. And so, so it literally just fizzled out. And she so have a cell number or anything. She's just, no, this was, this was a little bit before everyone had cell phones, but I kept mine the same for about five years afterwards. Um, and, and didn't, didn't hear anything. And I still have access to my old email. So we had email correspondence back then. Um, but my big thing that had happened, uh, heck, if we're talking about the reunion, I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you my big thing that happened where my brother came in and was very protective of me was in the searching for my birth family. Uh, our situation was a little bit different. So um, I know that people always like to imagine that the the birth family is is uh, poor and destitute and cannot afford the child. So I came from a wealthy family. Mm. And what had happened was the time frame I was searching for her, unbeknownst to me, the her mother, so what would have been my birth grandmother, had just passed away. So her father had already passed away. She passed away. So you imagine then the inheritance is rolling down. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, my uncle and her, and I can't remember the other family member that was on there, got letters that I existed. So they're like, okay, this person dies. This inheritance is coming up. And now we get to let this out of the blue. This adopted person comes, you know when that's not on my mind, (laughs) when, you know, my family makes enough money to be like, it's like, this is not my purpose. And again, I didn't, I was unaware of this. He got a lawyer to Uh. fight me. So he was unaware of my existence, 
had never known she had had a child, let alone, let alone two, which I think I already alluded to, but um, so he was unaware and then he was fighting me with a lawyer. So I had very little money on my own in my late twenties and I had to pay a lawyer to fight him to just send a letter and have this meeting with my birth mom. And so that's where my brother said, he was so angry. He's like, I don't like these people. What are they going to do to you? He's like, do you want me to come for this meeting with, with them? Like, and yeah. like basically like be a bodyguard. Like he was so worried. He just did not trust these people. That can make you feel more rejected and weird. That's just awful. It, you know, it just felt very much like, wow, I'm glad I'm not part of this family. Cause they're so obsessed with money that they don't understand that relationships can actually matter. And that they obviously don't understand how little information I have. I was unaware that anyone passed away. Like if I knew someone was sick, I probably would have searched earlier so I could meet my birth grandma before Mm -hmm. she passed, you know, she probably would have loved to have seen me. So, so that is the craziness of my story, but the two positives were that when the social worker called her, so when we finally, so the reason she was tough to find and why the uncle got found first is that she was taking care of her mom. So she had moved in with her mom. So, so the address of where they were mailing stuff was not the right address. Mm -hmm. Um, so when they finally got a hold of her and got a phone number and called her, she, the first thing she said was, Oh, which daughter? So I have a (laughs) sister. And then, and then, um, through all of the information and the social worker actually like brought this to me. So instead of keeping it from me, she brought this to me that she had been digging for me and found that my, I I have a very weird job outside of being a children's book author, like my actual full-time job. Um, I have a very weird job. And I just felt like as soon as I took a class in college, I was like, oh, this is what I have to do. Like, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. That is it. I'm a status. Oh, and and that is what my maternal grandfather did for a living. Wow. Yeah. It's not that common for sure. It's not common. And so when they said that, (laughs) to love it, to love being a love it. Yeah. (laughs) It's very weird. And so it's not weird. It's just, yeah, it's just different. It's just different. And I, Hey, I own it. I, I, (laughs) I like my uniqueness, but yeah. So, so that was cool. That was cool information. Um, and my social worker shared that cause it was in his obituary mm-hmm. that he had worked for a ton of years at this, at this company, you know, as, as a pricing analyst statistician. And I, so I she, have a question. Yeah. If, if she gave up two daughters mm-hmm. and the parents were very involved in that, as you said at the beginning, yep. that the parents were very with their money, they don't want the shame, whatever. The shame. It was. Yep. How did the brother, she had two siblings, you said, mm-hmm. how did they not even know? Was she living in their house or they kind of, she wouldn't be young enough like to go away. She just, not she, contact she went away. So, so, um, let me see if I can do the math. And is your so. sister younger or older? Older. She's okay. older. So it was in her early twenties when she was pregnant with her. And I did try to search for her. They found her and she just wasn't ready at the time. So I've just left it alone. I, I figured, you know, she can go back through that big, long red tape and find me if, if she wants. Uh, but she was also, yeah, she was also adopted. So she's about seven years o- older than me. Um, and birth mom knew her birthday, knew my birthday. Like, just like, this was very much it was a big deal to her. And she remembered as she was, she wanted to get to know me and how, you know, how things have been for me and all of that kind of stuff. But there was also this distance that, you know, that goes into that, right? Like the only way that you can live through something like that, where people make you feel so shameful is to change your brain about things and to kind of like compartmentalize. compartmentalize, desensitize yourself. Um, so I think that a lot of that had happened, but she was, she was lovely to talk to, like she, you know, and she just had all these facts and gave me lots of information that I didn't have. Um, did she tell yeah. you about your birth father? Um, no, she was very uncomfortable with that. She was very uncomfortable with that. And I will tell you, I met a birth cousin, which is also an interesting, interesting story. The daughter of the guy who paid the attorney to fight me. She accidentally found my letter in their house and she sneakily reached out to me 
Good for her. Yeah. And I had a relationship with her for a while. Um, there, it was very, um, up and down. I think there was, um, some extra stuff going on. She, she was pregnant and I think there's some, some mental health stuff, but it was very, it was very super, super close and super like it, it, it was more extreme than what I had been raised in. Um, and, uh, the only thing there was, uh, when I cut off that relationship was, um, about a year later, I got a text kind of, I mean, not the middle of the night, but like probably like 1030 at night. Right. Hadn't, hadn't spoken with her in just a couple of weeks, you know, just like how you have relationships. Right. So there was no issue, but just hadn't, hadn't spoke with her in a couple of weeks, got a text 1030 at night. And first of all, um, my birth mom did not ever know that this cousin had reached out to me, that we had this, this relationship because she was just very sensitive and a little fragile. Right. And so I'm like, just leave it alone. And she was the one that was obsessed with knowing about my birth father. I was, I was not right. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't necessarily need that. And so at 10 30 at night, I get a very casual text. Oh, I talked with your birth mom and here's your birth father's name just what? in a text, just like, and she was like, so proud of herself. And I said, how dare you send me a text like this without asking if I wanted to know this information without whatever well, even I was then, it's done. Kind of like that going behind your back thing. It went behind my back. Maybe she I thought, thought she was being helpful to you. She yeah. did. She did yeah. think she was being helpful to me. I had already kind of mentioned it to my birth mom, but remember there's so much shame that she's <laughs> held for all these years that when I asked, because obviously like having a, um, a biological sister that's seven years older, also placed for adoption, very likely we do not have the same father. Mm -hmm. So I had asked a question like, you know, Hey, I assume we don't have the same father. And she's like, uh, um, no, no, of course, of course you have the same father. Like I, I couldn't possibly have slept around like almost a decade separate, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, I feel bad for her shame. Like the family must've been really, mm must have been overbearing. Mm -hmm. It must, it must've been terrible. Yeah. I mean, she, I know she was, um, kind of shipped away to, because even the, where even at her age, yeah. Where they live and where, cause it's small town stuff mm -hmm. and they, and they had wealth in the small town. Right. So they were well-known. And so, yeah, the hospital, I was, and, and I just knew that by the facts I knew the hospital I was born at where she grew up and where they all lived and currently live. So are you, you know. at all, um, you did write to your sister, half sister. I had she, the social worker call her. And That's she wasn't the ready. Way it went. She wasn't ready. How long ago was that? Same thing about 14, 15 years ago. And you haven't tried since I'm going to, it's, it, <laughs> I, yeah, have you done DNA? That's what, that was my question. I please. have, I so, have. And the only people that popped up were some of the relatives I already, I already knew, but I just did it on ancestry. So and it is no, like nobody on your birth father's side or no, nobody, nobody at the time when I did it, I've not gone back in, but nobody has reached out to me like, Hey, this is strange. Looks like yeah, I have that. I have a bunch you. of people where they're just really? like, Oh, who's this? Okay. Random. <laughs> or <laughs> You're like, so well, when you explain. got his name, what did you do with that information? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I don't even necessarily believe it because of how, um, how strange my birth mom was when I asked her the questions, like immediately lying about that. Obviously like my half sister is my full sister, you know, seven years apart, unless he's like in the military and was shipped off for several years. It's, it's likely not the same man. And so I didn't even believe it. And so I did, I just didn't take it as an actual fact. And honestly, I just was done with it by the way the communication came through. I, I it just wasn't the right time for me. 10 30 at night. I had a lot, it was like a busy period in my life, a stressful period. And it just, I didn't need that emotional stress as well. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't want to ruin someone's life who obviously has no idea. So you're kind of, you at the moment, you've pretty much shut the door. On I have. I've shut the door. Um, I mean, I'm open just, to the sister. I'm open to the sister, but I've shut the door. It just was. What about the father? You know, like he might, you never, I mean, he might, I just don't even know the situation. Do I don't you know think you should like, say, I don't think you should think like you're going to ruin his life because yeah, I've, I've reached out and there there's been a shutdown, but like, you're not ruining their life for the, yeah, it could, you could be bringing a really big layer of joy to his life. 
That's true. I, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I think whenever I feel ready, yeah, I might, I think ready. the sister would be the first, yeah. the first one that I would mm-hmm. want to move on to, but yeah, it's, it is. It and is maybe hearing difficult. from you and not the social worker, the sister will be a little different 15 years later. I think so too. And, and very likely all of that red tape has changed. Right? Yeah. Also, it, might, maybe, it might be very different now. Yes. It, also her being adopted, you know, everybody gets to that out a of the fog place at yeah. different times in their life. You know, for us, it didn't happen until we were in our fifties. Like, yeah. Oh my God. So, you know, maybe it hasn't hit her yet or will, I cannot has believe now. you, I cannot believe you ladies are in your fifties. This is the craziest <laughs> thing I've learned today. <laughs> I'm shocked. You didn't know this. Know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you both look amazing. We are um, ba- you look great baby for scoop era through and through. <laughs> yep. Baby scoop era. Oh my goodness. Well, well, so boring BSEs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy. Well, it's it's interesting to now being an adoptive parent. Yes, tell and us I that know piece. that that is that is a strange thing to say, right, to other adoptees, especially on a show like this. Um, but I but I think it's important, and I just want to I want to share a couple of pieces, a couple of things that were very interesting to me uh, when I went through the process. What um, made you go through the process? Yeah. So, so I will start with, it's very rare to have like an adoptee. That's also an adoptive parent. I've Mm -hmm. met several of them, but it's very rare because Mm -hmm. usually infertility is what leads you to adopt and infertility is hereditary. Just like fertility is hereditary. Right. Um, and so, you know what? I did not know that. Yeah. Usually those things don't match. So, so that's why I actually have a lot of adoption in my family, because there's a lot of infertility, mm-hmm. right. in in the family. Um, and so, so yeah, it, it's just interesting stuff. So for us, I have a, um, biological older daughter. Um, and then a few years later, we decided to start trying and, uh, we basically experienced unexplained secondary infertility is what they call it. Uh, mm-hmm. We got pregnant multiple times. And after our fourth uh, miscarriage and they were really bad miscarriages, yeah. not the kind that they talk about, not the kind everyone thinks where it's like, you're bleeding, you're aware of it. You're cramping. No, no. I went in as a pregnant woman just to get another scan. I'd already had successful scans, successful appointments. And they're just like, no heartbeat. So, yeah. so I, I also just call it like the baby just died in my body like four times. So after the fourth one, we're like, okay, this is not how we are supposed to expand our family. And then we watched uh, friends around us go through painstaking links to try so very, very hard to continue their DNA lineage. Right. So like IVF and all these hormones and all this stuff. And we're just like, I don't even have anybody in my family. I mean, like my daughter but she doesn't even look like me. You know, it's just like, I'm like, this is not important. And then my husband also is adopted, but in a kind of a different way. So his mom was a single mom and she was pregnant. And the the guy was kind of out of the picture pretty immediately. And then she met his his father who later adopted him. And so he has a lot of adoptee symptoms because also, or like, it's very similar to all of us because abandonment stuff. Yeah. And his biological father was Asian and he was raised in a white household. Right. That's why our last name is Olson. And so when they're like, Oh, your husband is Chinese and Japanese. Like, yeah, I know it doesn't, it it doesn't all go, but it, it makes sense once you know. So, um, so yeah, so going through the process was interesting and this is like the home, the home study stuff. Right. Um, Did you have any um, thoughts about, you know, that, oh, I'm going to have, take someone else's baby as a, as a answer to my infertility. Like, did that go through your head? Because that is a lot of adoptees do have issues with that. Like I'm your infertility changed my life, you know? So curious what, what, what your feelings are or thoughts are about that. Absolutely. Addressing that to people who might be listening. Yes, absolutely. Um, that was very tough and we went about the approach. So, so it's also very different these days where the birth mom selects you, right? So it's a little different. And, and what we always talked about is 
we only want this if she needs this, right? So, so just because you go through all the things for adoption doesn't mean you actually have to end up adopting. Mm-hmm. And so we went through all the stuff, the home study stuff, you go through the thing where your profile's on there, and then you just like wait for the birth moms to like pick you or not pick you. And I know that adoptive parents have a hard time with like disruptions and stuff. And I have a hard time hearing about them sometimes because it's not a disruption. It's actually a great thing that she's going to parent. And, um, and so for us, we felt very different about it. We only wanted this if she wanted this. So we wanted to be the family if that's what she wanted. And we absolutely loved her. Um, so she picked us for a few different reasons, but one reason she mentioned was because uh, we are adopted and that she yeah. figured we would know how to relate to the child and that we would know what to do and how to support them. And every phone call that we got off with her during w- when she was pregnant was extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult for her. It left us in tears. Um, it was very Why difficult. Why was she giving up her baby? Yeah, I wanted to know that. Um, So I want to keep as much details private for our daughter and for the birth mom as possible. So I will give just a couple facts. Um, She was very, very young and already had two children. And, uh, and this was completely unexpected. And the age of my daughter and the middle son is very, very close. Mm. Um, And so, and, and, uh, and the birth father was not very nice about it. They were not, they were not dating and he was not very nice to her. He was just, he was just like, well, that's a terrible problem that was out. Right. So, um, so it just, I, left, I have a question in this yeah. and not because I don't, I understand about their privacy. That's yeah. important. Um, what about when, if, when you were going through this and having these conversations, if she had changed yeah. her mind, would yeah. you have supported her? Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We talked about that many times and we tried to prepare family and for friends that for that. Yeah. Cause it's like, people don't understand that. And they don't understand for sure from our perspective, because everybody is like excited for you. Like, Oh, you're going to expand the family. And there's a lot of weird things they say to you too. Yeah, um, sure. That, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like switching over to the side of the triad is like, so, I, I, I was correcting people all the time. <laughs> That's all I was doing. What I'm hearing is that she didn't have the resources. Well, and that it's a little different than that. So her parents were helping her a ton. Um, she was living with them. They were taking care of the, the other kids. They were more than happy to take care of another child. It was her decision. And um, again, I just don't, I don't want to get too deep. And I definitely don't want to talk about like her personal feelings of what she was telling us, but this was this was emotionally a lot to be a single mom of three. There was some different stigma than a single mom of two. Um, so, so I won't get into all of, all of the things to, to keep her feelings private, but this was very much a decision by her that she had to explain to her family. So like she already knew it wasn't her first child. She already knew what it meant to get support from the family. She already knew what it meant to work a full-time job and have a child at home and have two children at home. And then she was about to, like, she still had basically a toddler and a baby at home and about to have another baby. And it was, and it was too much. And so our Uh phone calls with her were us saying, you are enough. You are a good mom. You are like this. So we were extremely encouraging of her on these calls and we would, we would leave in tears, but she, she had made, she had made her decision and, um, and we are still very, very close with her. We, we go out to visit, we do not live close. So they live, um, several States away. We'll put it like that. So it's a flight, a connecting flight away. Um, and so we come to visit, but we send gifts to, to our daughter's brothers. We text all the time. I'm, I printed out some photos from our last visit, um, in July, and I'm sending them like printed photos as well as the ones that we send over text and stuff. So it's like, it's, it's not ideal. It's so not ideal, but we're trying to make this as, as how, best. How as old is she now? This. She's two and a half. Uh, do you mean the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Her yeah you're, two and, a half. You're yep. and then what about your, your biological daughter? She's uh, eight. She's eight. So yep. did she have feelings about this? And 
we we talked through everything and prepared her for everything. She was also a uh, part of the home study process. They like interview everyone in the family and all this stuff. Um, she was very, very excited. She definitely wanted to have a sibling and she actually is wonderful, but that's because there's such a big age gap. Right. So like, I remember on maternity leave, like I would be, I'd be feeding, I'd be feeding the baby and she would come in and go, you don't have a birth cloth. And she would run and go get one and bring it back. I'm like, this is very helpful. Thank you. (laughs) You know? So she's been just, they're very, very sweet together, but we talk about us as one big family. So we talk about that. She has two brothers and a sister. And, and in fact, even with the naming, so her birth mom had, had us name her, we made it be like a combination of her three older siblings names oh. so that it was, so it was like, and then her middle name is her birth mom's name. Like, so, and so, so does your, like, does your older daughter, does she, um, does she know the kids too? Like the little ones, oh, yeah. the boys and stuff. Yep. So they're all, I, I do, I do like your, your, I mean, you are doing the yeoman's job thing with this like really trying to make everybody for the situation that it yeah. is yeah we want How, it to was, were with... her parents the um birth mother's parents because they were willing to raise a third baby were they upset by the decision they were very upset in the beginning and she had family members that weren't talking with her and weren't communicating with her, but, um, but they came around and they, especially now that they know how involved we are with them, Mm -hmm. we actually have very good relationships with all of them as well. Um, and so, so it's quite, it's just, it's, it's, it's healing for all of us when we see them, It, it is wonderful. And she looks just like her birth aunt. So every time there, I'm obsessed. I'm always like, I got to get pictures of you guys, you know, because to me, I don't look like anyone, even, even my oldest daughter, the only person I know with my DNA, we don't look alike at all. So I'm like, oh, I got to get pictures of the two of you together. And so, you know, and so um, the coolest thing that happened in our last visit was that the boys wanted to call my oldest daughter, a sister. Oh, so she so feels, I was wondering if she would have sort of a a backlash of not being part of that group, you know, she does, she does our family. Um, I have, I, you know, as a mom, you have many things to worry about, but you know, I'm very, very careful and cautious and protective of our youngest daughter because of adoption. Our oldest daughter now, based on the story I just told is the only one in our family, not adopted. So now I have to be cautious about her family, her feelings that she's left out and that she is not adopted because I always talk about adoption and, you know, I've got the book and I go on podcasts and talk about it. So, so I have to be cautious of all, all the, all yes. the pieces and components. Yeah. So tell, do you tell us before we, before we start to wrap up about the reading, you oh, know, you right. started off about what, yes. what is out there for, for um, the literature that adoptive yes. parents are reading and that's tell us about this book so we can put it in our links and all that. Yeah. Stuff. That's why I wanted to come on the show because I think that, you know, as adult adoptees, we try to stay on top of what legislation is happening so that we can try to get closed documents mm-hmm. open and, and um, all of that kind of stuff, stuff for us as adult adoptees. But what I was baffled by. So in preparing for the adoption and birth of our daughter, got the nursery ready as like a parent does. Right. And then I'm like, okay, we've got tons of books from our oldest daughter, but I need to get adoption books. So I still had my two from 1979 that were very factual, right? They were just very factual about what happens. They weren't like children's books. They weren't engaging. Right. Like, okay, what are the highly recommended books? I bought a huge stack of them. I sat in there and I thought, oh, I'm I'm just going to read these in the nursery. You guys, I was massively offended really by most of them. And so I want to bring, I, I want to bring this to the attention of adoptees. This is what's being read to young adoptees right now. What, what was offensive not, about okay, just adoptees, not just adoptees, but we have adopted parents who do adoptive listen. parents that listen. Yeah, yeah. It's very important. And I t- talk on a lot of like podcasts and I do different things for DE and I for different companies and stuff to like explain to adoptive parents. But I also think it's important for adoptees because adoptive parents may come and ask us. And I was totally unaware of, of these books. So I will walk through some of them. So several of them had the lucky 
narrative mm-hmm. throughout. There's one, Phil, there's one book that would make you vomit. And, and I'm not going to say like the title of it or anything, but everyone that's listening that has looked at it, you will figure it out. But every spread gives you the icks. Uh, one particular spread is, yeah, one particular spread is you didn't have a home. Oh. Other side of the pitch, we were there to give you a home. Ugh, Disgusting. Every, the whole book, okay, is like that. And it's like you had tears. We were there to wipe your tears away. Like, disgusting. So there's that book. Uh, and then there's a slew of the books. So that's like real extreme. And then once they're like, you were chosen, like the stuff that's like, it's not positive. I mean, language. no, you weren't necessarily chosen. You were second choice. You were not. It's like You're the right. birth mom chose the family. You like, like, that's not even like the child being chosen is not a fact at all. This is not a shopping journey. This is, and that, what a terrible message to even send, right? Mm -hmm. So there's those that are real extreme. Then there are some that like can float in the middle where adoptive parents may not feel the same way that an adoptee would feel reading them. So one has these cute little bears. It's a bear mom (laughs) reading to a bear baby. I'm going to look these up. You got it. I'll, I'll, I'll actually just send you. I'll just email yes, you the yeah, list. Please. I'll bring the stack out because you guys, no joke, they were so bad. I have them hidden in our basement so that my husband will not accidentally pull them out and read them to our daughter. That's how bad I feel they are. But they are so, so most of the books were written by either people not touched by adoption at all, just famous authors, just like, I'll just write about adoption or adoptive parents. So there's, n- for so many of these books, there is not, that's why I think it's important that we know which ones are written by adoptees. Mm -hmm. So they have that appropriate lens. So a lot of these books have a really weird balance. So, so lucky theme and chosen aside, the other ones are kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, this thing of the adopt, it's like the adoptive parent, you know, this bears reading to her little bear. We loved you. And before you're born, there was this, you know, um, we wanted you and this want grew and grew and grew. You'll notice I'm not saying exactly the words, but you'll get it, <laughs> which book it is. But anyways, and then they actually talk about the birth mom. So the birth mom's almost never illustrated in these books, right? She's not a main character at all in these books that there are some where it is, which, um, uh, I could talk about later, but when they talk about her, it is not balanced. I'm so sure. it's all the love of the adoptive parents. The big want is growing. The big want is growing. And your birth mom struggled. She struggled and struggled and struggled and then made this choice for you. That poor birth mom. That poor birth mom. And Mm-mm. I actually read that book. And as an adoptee, I don't think I've ever felt more abandoned than by the time I closed that book. <sighs> I thought, oh my God. And they're reading this all the time. The they're children. Thinking, the children and it, but it's this lovely bear. Right. So, um, I, I, they're all, when I just kept reading through them, the imbalance, right. Adoptive parents had a lot of struggle to get them to the place of adoption, but you're not going to talk about that. You're going to talk about your love. The birth mom had a lot of love trying to make this difficult decision, but they had a lot of love, but we're only going to talk about the struggle. So it's like, it just, they were so unbalanced to me. So, so my particular book, I tried to balance it out and have the love and the love other books, um, by adoptees. We've got one that's by an adoption therapist, right? Which is great. Like it's a great resource. So I'm kind of, can I go ahead and just name some of these books? So the good ones. Yeah, please. The good ones, not, not the bad ones, the good ones. Um, Okay. So, so mine is called surrounded by love and open adoption story. It's very specifically about open adoption. I do not recommend it. If the child is not part of an open adoption, do not want them to feel left out that they are not close, have a close yeah. relationship with their birth family. Um, another one is adoption is both by Alina Hall. She is, um, she is an author, a friend of mine, only because we speak at different things. It is a great book. She is also, um, she works in adoption um, and it is adoptions both. And it goes through the whole book. Adoption can be happy. Adoption can be sad. Adoption can, you can be mad. You can be, and it, it like goes through all of these different emotions. It's a great one for young adoptees. I would have liked that as a kid to have a book where it named 
my issues. Yes. And allowed comfort yeah. to talk about it with mm-hmm. your parents. Yeah. So that's a good one. I've also got uh, Marie discovers her superpowers. That was that's the um, adoptee, adoptive parent, adoption therapist. Her name is uh, Dr. Shetra Weirta Lika or Leaker. I I have you know it'll be in the show notes. The, the yeah, when you send us your books. your bio, yeah. we'll we'll have the we'll put everything in the show links. That's for sure. That's- yeah. That one is very helpful. It walks um, adoptive parents through typical things we encounter as an adoptee, right? A kid either making fun of us or just asking us really inappropriate questions and how to handle that, right? With with your child and in a she's really an adoptee. cute way. I've, she's I've seen an adoptee. Her, something. Yeah. her name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She she's great. And then the other one that I would recommend it's it's being adopted by Amy Wilkerson. It, it is great about all the different types of adoption, like international, um, closed, open LGBTQ plus. It's got a lot of that, but again, written from a lens of an adoptee. Um, and then I'm working on another book, um, that I'm going to release in October. That's actually not for adoptees because there is nothing out there for non-adoptees. So you think about, I don't know how you guys feel, but I feel like Outside of the adoption community, I still get the language and the weird things said to me. It's like it's the 1950s. Yeah. And we've got to do something about educating non adoptees. And I wanted to give American Baby to like everybody Mm -hmm. for Christmas this year. (laughs) Right. That exactly. Yeah. And so think about if we could get that too for like children. So parents now want to teach their kids about diverse other other things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in this book, it actually goes through like a little question and answer. It's like this boy comes home at dinner. He's like explaining to his family, like, Oh, my friend, like I found out she's adopted. I didn't know what it was. And it goes through their conversation. So I'm trying to take the heavy load off the adoptee to have to answer all these questions. So it's a great book for the cousin, the friend, a little kid that maybe friends we had growing up. That friends you, you had growing up stuff. that you yeah. had to teach about adoption. Yeah. These are really great resources. That's, yeah. that's great. We will definitely put them. Thank you for sharing and sharing your story and being honest Thanks. and open and brave, yeah, honest and open and brave. Cause, yeah. cause you are on a different, you do have a different lens of it all. And I think these yeah. are important conversations for education and um, and I hope adoptees listening can appreciate that because you've, you've had kind of the f- scope of it and it's important to know, like, I didn't know these books. I would like to know the, the bad ones too. I'd like to look into them. She'll yeah. send them to us. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'll send you the list of the bad ones. <laughs> Thank it's you so growing much. Allison. Growing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks you guys. This has been wonderful. Again, it's been really yeah. great. Awesome. Thanks for coming wonderful. on. Wonderful. Send us our screenshot too. Yeah. And I thanks will. for being a Patreon. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.